Hello everyone, it's an honor and pleasure to be sharing my thoughts on a specific idea here. Thanks to Tamil Nadu Investor Association for giving me this opportunity. Uh, I have only 20 minutes, so I'm gonna, and I have a lot of ground to cover, so I'm gonna be a bit fast. A quick introduction, I'm Jatin Khimani, I'm a CFA charter holder. Uh, I belong to Delhi, where I run an independent equity research firm by the name of Stalwart Advisors. We are registered with SEBI and we blog at stalwartvalue.com slash blog. Uh, this is not to be construed as an investment advice. We may own stocks personally and also our clients may own it. Uh, we are registered with SEBI as investment advisor. Some other mandatory disclosures as per SEBI uh, research analyst regulation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about this company for next 20 minutes and then share the name of the company so that you don't leave the room. Uh, what you see on your screen is last 10 years of financials of this company. So notice that revenues have grown from 100 odd crores to 1350 crores. That's a more than 10 fold jump. Uh, that's a 25% CAGR over last decade. And also note that there has not been a single year when, where the sales dropped. So it has been a very steady rise over the last decade. How about margins? Uh, margins have ranged between 7.5 to about 20%. Uh, barring FI9, when it steeply dropped to 7, otherwise it has been fairly stable. Uh, there was some one-off in that year and if, if you see subsequently in FI10 and FI11, it jumped uh, steeply. So on an average, margins have been 13.7% over this period. Uh, how about return on capital employed, which is the most important metric? On an average, this company has done 25% ROC over this period. Uh, data for FI 77 to 9 was not available because this has picked from the segment. This became a material segment only uh, FI 10 onwards. So fairly robust performance over last 10 years. What does this company do? So they are into maize processing. They basically process corn. And what do they make out of it? They make following products. The first is basic starch. Uh, starch is a very basic commodity. It has a lot of applications. Uh, the key applications are it's used in baking products as a thickening agent. Uh, it finds applications in textile, textile industry. It is also uh, used in paper industry. This is the commodity part of the business. What's interesting is they process this starch to make derivatives. The, key, the six key derivatives are following and we'll spend some time understanding each one of these in the next slide. Uh, all these processes lead to a lot of residuals and byproducts also like corn germs, oil, cattle feed. Again, a commodity. Bulk of the value addition is in this part of the business, which is starch derivatives. So let's spend some time understanding what are these products. First is something called sorbitol 70% solution. It's a polyol used as a bulk sweetener across FMCG, baking products. Uh, so the next time you use your toothpaste, just turn the pack, see the label, you will see sorbitol as an ingredient. Uh, next is maltodextrin, a complex carbohydrate, again used as a bulking agent, uh, some very critical applications like infant food, dry beverage mixes. Third is dextrose monohydrate, a crystallized D-glucose used as a sweetener in baking products, dairy items, brewing. Liquid glucose, uh, a corn syrup. So the cough syrup which you use, the body of that syrup is made of corn syrup. Similarly, it's used in vitamin tonic, in tablet coating. Fifth is high maltose syrup. It's a gluten-free carbohydrate used as a sweetener and preservative in hard candies, frozen desert, etc. Finally, dextrose anhydrous, a simple carbohydrate, again used as a sweetener in very critical applications like it's used in antibiotics, it's used in IV fluids, which is intravenous fluids, uh, glucose injections, rehydration, drip lines, so on and so forth. It's a very, very versatile product. 
all in all there are more than 4000 applications of starch and starch derivatives it's used across fmcg across pharma a uh, lot of industrial uses like in paper textile some of these are mentioned so this this company supplies to all blue chip pharma and fmcg companies some of the names i have put on the screen uh, blue chip companies like biocon paras pharmaceutical fmcg companies like itc unilever dairy companies like amul parle the for these customers they prefer quality over cost which is actually a great entry which makes a great entry barrier in this industry so if some vendor is supplying the same products at let's say 10% lower cost it doesn't do anything because quality is extremely important we are talking about uh, food products we are talking about pharma products here which are highly regulated industries the other part is these products form less than 1% of the cost but they are critical ingredients so the while the cost of ownership is low the cost of failure is extremely high uh, again providing some cost some kind of switching cost for a new vendor the approval process is anywhere between 2 to 3 years despite being a b2b business this they have a fairly diversified client base so the top 10 clients contribute less than 30% of revenues Let's talk about the industry. The total industry size in India today is about a billion dollars, so about 7,000 odd crores. The industry is growing at 7-8% per annum. A key positive is that India has abundant maize crop. We are the fourth largest corn producer in the world. This year we are projected to have 27 million tons of maize crop. What does it really take to succeed in this industry? On the first slide, the numbers I showed you, what did this company do differently to execute so well and have such amazing financials. I think the first is to have multi-location plants across the country. Uh, maize is a very logistics heavy crop. You need to be very close to the crop producing areas. Similarly, you need to be close to your customers. This is the only company in the country which has presence in all major corn producing areas. So they have four large plants uh, in Gujarat, second one in Uttarakhand, third one in Karnataka, and recently they have come up with the fourth plant in Chalisgaon, Maharashtra. So these are the four large corn producing geographies in the country, and they save a lot of cost in terms of inward freight. Similarly, because they have multiple plants, they are close to their customers also. So they, they save freight outward also. Similarly, they are very, not just OPEX efficient, they are very CAPEX efficient too. The last plant which they came up in Chalisgaon, that was at half the cost of what Cargill uh, set up in 2012. Second is, you need to have an efficient procurement and inventory management. This company is the largest corn buyer in the country. Every year in the month of March, they buy corn worth 700 crores. What this does is, if industry is buying, let's say, at 14 rupees a kg, this company, because of bulk procurement, and they buy it one shot for the entire year, they get at let's say 13.25 or 13.5 per kg which is an upfront 4 to 5 percent cost advantage in an industry where practically people are operating at that kind of profit margins which makes them a lowest cost producer which is the success mantra in commodity businesses right you have to be the largest you have to be the most efficient and you have to be the lowest cost producer finally having the financial muscle to do both without resorting to debt. It's a cyclical industry. One bad year can wipe you out. So here's this company which, is, which has zero long-term debt. They've been able to create all the gross block from internal accruals. There is some working capital, but against that, obviously, you have inventory setting. Otherwise, this is a debt-free company in an industry where almost everybody is so much leveraged that every two, second or third year, a lot of players go bust. How's the competition faring? The largest company in this industry is a player called Riddhi Siddhi Glucoboils. Uh, this company in 2012 was taken over by a French giant uh, called Rocket. Since then, they've been struggling. Last year, what we understand is they were operating at 50% capacity utilization and they are loss making. Uh, another key player called Anil Limited, it's a listed company based out of Ahmedabad, uh, had a top line of 1000 crores. And uh, so, so very meaningful player. They had about 15% market share. And they also had a 1,000 crore debt on which they defaulted last year. 
the company has gone bankrupt it's in nclt right now all the factories are shut sukhjit starch uh, a company based out of punjab we understand it's operating at about 65 70% utilization and it is now raising debt to diversify into building a food park in punjab kargil india another meaningful player operating at about 60 70% utilization last year they incurred a 130 crore net loss Gulshan Polyols, a company based out of Muzaffarnagar, uh, UP, operating at about 75% utilization, mainly into Sorbitol 70% solution. So not a very integrated player. All in all, the industry is operating at about 50-60% capacity utilization, whereas this company is always running out of capacity. Last year, they operated at 90% utilization. In April this year, they commenced uh, their fourth plant, which increased their capacity from 2,000 tons per day to 3,000 tons per day, uh, which, which is a 50% jump. They invested 250 crores in this plant, all from internal accruals. Now, the amazing part is that they're already operating at 65% utilization in this new capacity too. Practically, they were not, they had, they had no presence in this industry a decade ago. From literally zero to today, they have a 20% market share. They have been capturing all the market share, incrementally, incremental growth, plus every second, third year, some of the other player is going bust and they are able to uh, fill that gap. There is an amazing optionality in this business uh, because they are launching a new product called High Fructose Corn Syrup, HFCS. Now, what is this product? It's again a starch derivative and it is commonly used as a sweetener that is as a substitute for sugar in aerated drinks. So in drinks like Coke, Pepsi, globally, uh, they get sweetened not using sugar but HFCS. China allowed this product in 2004 and today they consume 4.2 million tons of HFCS annually. Uh, similarly, in US, 50% of the sweetener market is catered by HFCS. So annually, it's about a 9 million tons product. How about India? Zero. Sugar continues to be the primary sweetener because we don't even have an, a, 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 an FSSAI approval for this product. So literally the product doesn't exist in India, which is why our per capita consumption of starch is merely one and a half kgs versus six odd kgs globally. Uh, at today's price, HFCS would cost similar to sugar at about 30, 31 rupees a kg. But the prices are very stable and not as volatile as sugar. Uh, secondly, you know, if you produce one kg, one ton of sugar, you need 22 tons of water. Uh, in a state like Maharashtra, which has deficiency of even drinking water, I think it's it's a shame we are producing so much sugar cane in that state. Uh, if you compare if you compare water consumption for HFCS, it's less than one tenth. It's two tons per ton of HFCS versus 22 tons for sugar cane. So I think uh, for these environmental reasons, it's a matter of time. The choices would have to be redone. Uh, cola companies have approached this company, which we are talking about, uh, to manufacture the product in India. And also they have approached to FSSAI for the approval. Uh, this has been going on for last year, year and a half and in next 6 to 12 months we should see uh, the product getting approved. Uh, this company would have a first mover advantage in this product and if you see globally how HFCS has taken off, uh, if, that, if this gets approved in India and is able to win market share from sugar, the overall starch industry from 7000 crore can multiply and grow many fold because this is such a huge uh, potential. Though there is a sugar lobby and politicians are involved in this business, all those bottlenecks are there, uh, but, uh, but finally things are moving and let's see how this shapes up. Purely an optionality, we are giving zero value to it. If at all it comes, uh, you know, it's a bonus. So this is, that was the business of last 10 years. Uh, that was relatively a new business for this company. But this company has been in existence since 1991. So about 27 odd years. The legacy business for this company used to be solvent extraction and refining for edible oils. Uh, 
they're the, they're the second largest oil extractor in the country after Ruchi Soya. Last decade was literally a lost decade for this industry. And the reason why I say that is because there was an inverted duty structure. India is anyways a net importer. Uh, we import 30-40% of our oil consumption uh, from other countries. Because of inverted duty structure, the domestic guys kept losing market share. Uh, what this means is that the exporting countries were levying less duty on refined oil versus crude oil so that they can capture better part of value addition in their geography. So th all the infrastructure of uh, extraction and refining in the country was literally lying idle over last decade because of massive dumping. Now I believe there are a lot of triggers which have taken place in last two years uh, which are structurally changing uh, again the face of this sector. The first is rolling out GST. Uh, so earlier what used to happen was there was a lot of under invoicing and also one would import in one state where the taxes were lower and then sell in some other state. Now with GST those things have stopped to a great extent. Second is import duty which used to be 5% let's say two and a half years ago uh, has jumped to 54% that's an 11 fold jump in import duty of most of the edible oils. I'll show you in the next slide. On top of that, export incentives of 10% have been uh, offered to the domestic uh, guys exporting out of India. Uh, amidst, amidst the trade war going on uh, globally, China has levied an import duty on US soya and China is a very big importer of uh, soya and soya oil. So this has now forced China to reconsider abolishing the ban on Indian oil which they levied in 2012. So this is already in the process and in a couple of months as and when China starts re-importing from India the opportunity size is huge. Finally you know we can have difference of opinion in terms of how government is uh, uh, government has done over last uh, four odd years. But we would, I, I'm sure you'll all agree that there's been a big focus on rural India, on agricultural economy. They've been talking about doubling farm income. How do you do that? Uh, less than 10% of agricultural produce in India gets processed, which is why so much food gets wasted. Uh, globally, if you see comparable numbers, it's much, much higher in terms of processing. So this is the way forward food industry has to uh, grow in order to improve farm gate prices and uh, uh, which can only lead to prosperity of farmers. So there have been a lot of great steps taken by government. Of course, execution varies, but uh, the focus has been on food processing industry in a big way. Uh, increase of import duties, introduction of export incentives, all of these are in line with this incentive. So look at the way uh, some of the import duties have moved in a matter of last 18 months itself. So. For crude sunflower oil from 12 and a half it has jumped to 38 and a half. For something like refined soya bean oil again uh, trebled from 15% to 49.5%. This is a huge and a massive change which has led to turnaround in this oil segment. Uh, look at the EBIT margin in FI16 when practically the entire industry was bleeding this guy was still making money at operating level. Uh, but it was hardly anything. On a turnover of 1400 crores, they were making an operating profit of 10 crores. This jumped from 0.7% to 4.4 in FI17 and 7.4 in FI18. Uh, from practically no operating profit, today this company is doing 130 crores EBIT on capital employed of 529 crore, translating into an ROC of 25%. Now the beauty is this segment is still operating at only 30% utilization. At full capacity utilization, the potential revenues can be as high as 6,000 crores. Margins can be volatile, but as utilization picks up, there is an element of operating leverage. And with all these tailwinds, I think this segment can be the dark horse. When we invested in this company, honestly, we ascribe zero value to this segment. The maize processing business itself is so amazing and structural. Uh, we thought even if oil doesn't do anything, we are okay. But this has been purely a bonus and something which has potential to add a lot of value to the thesis. Uh, I am running 
out of time quickly i'll cover i'll quickly cover few other elements balance sheet as i said is very strong on equity of 23 crore uh, they have a net worth of 1000 plus crores zero long term debt uh, there are working capital loans of about 600 odd crores that's because every year in the month of march they have to procure lot of corn and eventually soya uh, because it's an agricultural crop you have to the buying is all uh, uh, in march and april and then you and they buy for the entire year at one shot uh, then they keep uh, consuming that inventory so the march numbers are elevated throughout the year uh, as inventories go down the working capital also goes down this year they are expected to have a lot of free cash so i'm expecting even the working capital loans will go down uh, they pay out about 5% because it's a capital intensive business huge size of the op- opportunity incremental rocs are 25% so it makes sense to uh, conserve cash and plow back in the business for growth capital allocation historically may not have been that great but uh, over last 2 3 years there have been a lot of signs to show that uh, th- things are falling in place all incremental capex is happening only in mass processing because agro processing business does not need capital and there is a small textile segment too which we'll talk about in the subsequent slides uh, who is running the show so a gentleman called mr manish gupta he started this company along with his father in 1991 Uh, uh unfortunately his father expired 6 months ago and his brother has moved out of the moved out of the business last year so now here we have an owner operator who is also the sole driver of the company uh, has sufficient skin in the game his family owns 64% stake in the company he is also the president of industry body and uh, we have met most of his uh, peers and uh, other guys in the value chain the feedback has been encouraging uh mr manish uh, is very ambitious very competent and he's fully focused on the business uh, the execution speaks for itself uh, anyways and he's all of 46 years of uh, age so i think the best uh, of his uh, uh, best best lies ahead of him uh, they've recently roped in a professional C- cfo mr dinesh shah uh, he's a qualified chartered accountant couple of decades of experience his last stint was with, was with make money organics and a chemical listed company uh, as as the cfo so talking about valuation uh, the market cap is about 2700 crores trailing net profit 216 crores so available at 12 and a half times price to earnings multiple uh, in terms of ev ebitda it's available at 9 times uh, honestly we expect uh, earnings to grow substantially over next 3 years that's our uh, primary thesis any re rating uh, is bonus and as the share of maze which is much higher quality business a structural business and the competitive position is getting strong every day i think uh, as the share of uh, profitability uh, of maze goes in the overall uh, pie the stock has potential to get re-rated some hygiene factors uh, in terms of cash flows if you see last 5 years 7 years see cumulative pre tax earnings and compare that with the cash flow from operating activities uh, you you will be impressed with the kind of cash gener- cash generation the company has accounting has been conservative uh, last year they paid 23% tax because one of their plants uh, had a tax rebate uh, there has been no equity dilution after ipo in fact they did a 17% buyback in 2017 uh no related party transactions promoter holding is 64% which is fairly high no pledging by promoters uh is there a threat from chinese imports uh so far there has been no chinese imports the reason is because it's a very tiny ingredient uh plus logistics cost is high uh and uh, the customers prefer quality over cost so so far uh, there has been no chinese uh, no threat from chinese imports the logistics cost itself kind of makes it unviable Uh, this is another important uh, point and checklist we all must have today is there a threat from app uh, the answer is no uh, there is no threat from a mobile app or internet uh, is ina depreciation positive for this company yes they are net exporters uh, fi 17 they had merely exports of 200 crores fi 18 that figure became 600 odd crores and with all the import duties export incentives rupee depreciation uh exports seem uh, uh favorably placed so what are the risks and concerns uh, the biggest is capital allocation uh they have another legacy unit called uh, in the business of textile it's a small unit uh, about 200 odd crores of top line 
बट यू नो टेक्सटाइल इज़ अ सैड बिजनेस टू बी इन यू आर परपैचुअली ऑन अ ट्रेड मिल सो टू ईयर्स अगो दे इन्वेस्टेड फिफ्टी करोर्स इन दिस सेगमेंट सो दैट दे कैन एटलीस्ट ब्रेक इवन विच वॉज अ सैड कैपिटल एलोकेशन बट देर इज सम सेंटिमेंटल रीजन अटैच दे डोट वॉन्ट क्लोज इट इट द इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर इज शेयर विद अदर सेगमेंट्स so now it's kind of breaking even and they say that incrementally no capital will be allocated in this segment we have to uh, we have to see how that pans out uh, second is key man risk uh, mr manish gupta is the sole driver of the company today he is uh, uh, he is behind the entire execution which you saw on the first slide he is still very very integral to the company i i don't think there is a very strong second line or third line in terms of professional management so uh his service his continued services would be integral for the company to uh, continue to do well finally oil processing segment can be volatile that's not structural some of the changes could be structural but uh, uh, there is that uh, regulatory involvement and uh, so so let's see how that pans out cyclically i think we things are favorable even in that segment to summarize it's an owner operator business with skin in the game first generation entrepreneur he's ambitious strong debt free balance sheet they are market leader in an expanding niche the winning market share uh, which speaks for the execution they are the lowest cost and most efficient uh, uh, guys in the industry which is very important in any uh, business there is big optionality in high fructose corn syrup and oil processing segment negligible institutional holding negligible sell side coverage I think it's mispriced because of old perception of being an oil refiner. What's the name of the company? It's Gujarat Ambuja Exports Limited. It's among our top five holdings. We've added till twenty three, twenty four hundred crores kind of market cap. If we had no exposure, we would not shy away from start uh, from uh, you know from building a position even at today's price. I think it continues to be attractive. Though we have hit our allocation, so we are not adding. Uh, we could be wrong. Do your own due diligence. we focus at portfolio level returns and not individual stocks uh, we own 19 other stocks and we don't know which one is virat kohli in our team uh, uh, so gujarat ambuja's initiating coverage report along with agm notes scuttle but everything is now made available on the guest dashboard so even if you're not a subscriber or subscriber of stalwart advisors you can still still freely access all the reports and research notes we have released on gujarat ambuja uh it's very simple it'll take a minute you once you visit our website stalwartvalue.com on top right you will see a green button which says free sign up once you click on that you will be able to create account and along with gujarat ambuja see all the stock reports on all the stocks uh, which we have exited till date and a lot of current ideas too with that i'll wrap up uh, for any feedback and queries please let us know at support at stalwartvalue.com our blog is stalwartvalue.com/blog and you can also uh reach out to us through these uh, twitter handles uh, once again thank you for listening